Hi there, Martin Newman, Consumer Champion, and I'm going to talk to you now about my new approach to return on investment. I've created 10 new ROIs, and the reason why I've done that is I believe the traditional way that we measure return on investment is not really effective anymore. What we've tended to do in the past is basically look at a simple calculation, which is we spend X pounds and we get X pounds back. And in most businesses, uh, really including today in 2023, if we can't prove a business case for what we want to invest in, then we're unlikely to get the support and the backing of the CFO and the board of the business to do that. And I think there's a problem with that because essentially that actually stifles innovation. It stifles agility because ultimately it doesn't allow people to test and learn. And that's because in a lot of organizations, actually we have a fear of failure at the heart of the culture of the business. People are scared to make decisions. And actually in bigger businesses, what I tend to find is often we need to almost have everybody on board with a decision, with a decision before anything happens. And as I say, that's just another reason why there is no agility and why there isn't the level of innovation that there needs to be and why so many businesses in so many sectors are finding themselves disrupted. And ultimately, that's why I think the ROI model is broken because it doesn't allow businesses or individual stakeholders to test and learn or develop at the pace required to take advantage of the opportunities in a market and to combat competitive threats. So that's why I've created my 10 new ROIs which I believe businesses can leverage now to not only build customer lifetime value, but actually I think it's pretty much the only model that you can adopt, which will give you a guarantee of future commercial success. So what are these 10 or 10 ROIs? Well, the first one is return on inspiration. And I'm going to get into all of these in more detail in a minute. So return on inspiration is all about setting up our colleagues for success. Return on integrity is the second one, and that's about building trust with our customers. Return on inclusion from a diversity and inclusion perspective, creating a business that better reflects our customers. So we have a workforce that actually reflects the community and the people that we're trying to sell to and engage with. The fourth is return on image and being socially responsible. The fifth is return on intervention, where we sort out issues for customers. So they don't actually churn and leave our and leave our brand and stop engaging with us. The sixth ROI is return on interaction. And that's about turning up where our customers want us to be. You might think of that or know that as channel strategy. The seventh is about return on improvements, which is where we move from just transacting with customers to actually becoming more of a service provider. The eighth is return on involvement. The more we engage with customers with the right level of personalized messaging, communication, and pro overall proposition, the more frequently our customers will come back to us time and time again. The ninth is return on insight, where we move from reporting data to leveraging actionable insight to improve performance. And the tenth is about return on innovation, always moving forward and at pace as we continually seek to improve what we do. The first is return on inspiration. If we don't put our own people first, how can we expect them to deliver the experience we want our customers to have? And if they don't feel inspired to come to work every day, then we failed to truly engage with them, haven't we? And to support this fact, I recently read a Gallup survey that found that only 15% of the global workforce actually feel engaged. In other words, 85% feel disengaged. They're doing the bare minimum to make it through the day and from paycheck to paycheck. They're actually just trying to survive, but they're certainly not thriving and we're not creating an environment in which they can thrive. Now, these stats are even more concerning when you look at the United Kingdom, where only 8% of our employees across, across all of our industries actually feel engaged. And that's why I believe the employee experience is the first building block for any business to think about when it comes to be truly customer centric. You can't be truly customer centric if you don't inspire and look after your own people. I'm going to give you some examples of brands that focus on that and I think do it well. The hotel chain Hyatt, they enable their housekeepers to decide whether they can whether they finish their work early because they've cleaned all the rooms that they've allocated to them or they can clean more to earn more money. That's complete empowerment of those colleagues. They're also, uh, primary caregivers are also supported financially with eight weeks of paid leave. 
So there's a business that I think has a culture of looking after their people, empowering their people and inspiring their people to do the best they can in their work. Another business that does this is Timson the Cobbler. Um, you may go in there to get your keys cut. You might go in there to get your shoes rehealed. They empower their colleagues to make decisions without the need for approval from a manager. Hence, leading to better outcomes for customers. So anyone working in that business on the front line of their organization, they can set up discounts or offer discounts. They can set up promotions or they can give compensation to a customer when something's going wrong. And that's because they're completely empowered to do that. So imagine the impact that has on the consumer. You can measure the impact of employee engagement in several ways. Here are some of them. Well, first of all, employee satisfaction and pulse surveys allow you to gauge how your colleagues feel about working in your business. Your levels of staff retention tell you whether your people want to come on the journey with you or not. If they continually increase, if these continually increase, then great. And if not, you've got a problem you're going to have to address. So looking at employee promoter scores, EPS, would be a great way of gauging whether your colleagues would recommend you as an organization to work for to other people or not. That's a great way of working out how your people feel about working in your business. Some quick wins now. Listen to the voice of your colleagues. Give them a voice in the first place. Ask them how they feel about working there. That feedback will help you to make some quick changes that will improve their views and their level of engagement. Empower them to make decisions without always having to ask for permission. And if needs be, put some guardrails around that. Remove this whole idea, this whole sense of failure from decision making by both empowering colleagues, but also rewarding innovation. So encouraging them to come forward with ideas. Start to work on employee development plans if they don't already exist. And there is no one size fits all. So you really need to work out on an individual basis what really makes different people tick. And look at what training or upskilling you can provide them and implement in the near term in order to make them feel even more engaged with your business because you care enough about them to actually develop them and teach them new skills. My second ROI, return on integrity. I'm sure you'll all remember the Volkswagen emissions scandal in 2015, essentially where the business lied to consumers, lied to the market about the level of emissions from their diesel cars. Now, they've obviously learned from that experience, but I can tell you their share price has never recovered from where it was at a peak in 2015, and it fell off a cliff at that point. Now, I'm not suggesting that's because Volkswagen don't make good cars, because they make great cars. But the problem is they lost trust or a lot of customers, more importantly, lost trust in them. And it takes a long time to convince customers to come back. Just to reinforce that, according to some research from Salesforce, 68% of customers won't buy from companies with poor ethics. Now, you contrast that with Patagonia, who are one of, if not possibly, the most socially responsible brands in the world today. Their founder actually gifted the entire business to various charitable trusts in 2022 who were supporting climate change initiatives. And over the past few years, on Black Friday, they've given all the funds, all the sales they generated on that day away to different climate change initiatives. And that is why, that's an example of why 80% of customers are more, are more loyal to companies with good ethics. So good ethics actually pay. They make you deliver a better return on investment. Now, you can measure return on integrity in the following ways. You can do customer surveys. You can, do, you can measure net promoter scores. You can also measure them before and after. For example, when somebody contacts your contact center business or your customer care team. You can measure it through the level of social media engagement because the more customers are aligned with your values and behavior, the more likely they are to engage publicly with your brand as well and promote you on, in terms of how they feel about you as a brand. Some quick wins. Review your policies on sustainability and social responsibility. And the key here is to make sure that you're walking the talk, implementing the necessary improvements. It's also really important that you're open and honest to customers about where you are on that journey. I always find that consumers are very forgiving as long as you're open and honest with them. Look at how you can transition customer service to customer care. And the reason for that is that customer service tends to be a cost focused exercise that pushes customers away because we're not really focused on resolving their issues first time. Whereas customer care is about wrapping our arms around customers and making sure we always do the right thing for them. 
and it's driven by the desire to increase customer satisfaction and lifetime value. Conduct a customer survey and potentially run focus groups for social listening, because all of that will help you get under the skin of what your customers really think and feel about your business. My third ROI is return on inclusion. There are 4 million disabled people in Australia. There are 14 million disabled people in the United Kingdom, and there are around 70 million in the US. That represents a multi-billion dollar opportunity in all of those markets. Take the UK, the 14 million disabled consumers, as a percentage of retail, you're talking about a 350 billion pound addressable market to pursue if, as a brand, you can communicate and cater more effectively for the needs of diverse groups. But I can tell you that very few retailers or very few brands and other sectors are doing a very good job of addressing the needs of that customer base in an overt and relevant way. And they must do better to cater for those needs. I mean, to give you an example, today, and it's 2023, and I know this for a fact because I talk to a lot of consumers, consumers who are visually impaired and need a guide dog to actually get around and live their lives are often turned away from retail businesses and other businesses because the, the staff, the security, the staff in the store, whoever it happens to be, seems to think they're not allowed into the store with a dog. It's actually against the law, but it's of course morally bankrupt to treat these people like that. Now, the reverse of that is take a brand like Specsavers. They proactively advertise to customers that if they have a mental health issue or any form of physical disability, don't worry if you can't get to a Specsavers branch, their opticians, their partners who run those stores will come to these customers' homes. Now imagine the goodwill that that generates. It's incredible, you know, both with their friends, family, and of course, those customers themselves. Now, diversity and inclusion, of course, does not stop there. The average gender pay gap around the world today is 17%, but it ranges anywhere from 3 to 51% which is madness. And yet all the evidence suggests that gender diverse leadership teams are actually 20% more profitable than those that aren't. So you can measure return on inclusion or return on diversity and inclusion in a number of ways. Your increase in productivity, your increase in innovation and all the ideas that come back to the business, your increase in sales and profitability, the increase in employee satisfaction and the increase in employee promoter scores. Those are five key ways you can immediately focus on how to how your improvements and efforts in diversity and inclusion are paying back for the business. So what are some of the quick wins? Well, you can start to plan how you can ensure that your business is fully accessible and that you communicate effectively with all disabled customers. You can review the makeup of your organization, the structure and the people that are in it from a diverse group perspective from a religious perspective, a gender perspective, an ethnicity perspective, a sexuality perspective, a disability perspective, and demographics. Where do your people come from? Because again, if your colleagues and the makeup of your business doesn't reflect the, the communities of customers that you're actually selling to and serving, how can you possibly expect to do the best job that you can? You just won't. Next, you can create a plan that highlights how you'll address any gaps or weaknesses to that. And you really do need to do that. Um, how about ensuring that all the CVs of all the candidates that apply to your organization, you remove any personal information in terms of where they live, where they're from, the school, the college or the university they went to and their names. That way you remove any initial unconscious bias where people might exclude them from the interview process because of one of the above. And that way you're judging them and you're basing, uh, your, 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 basing your decision on whether to interview them or not, purely on their skills and experience. My next ROI is return on image. We all have guilt about what we buy and from whom we buy it and how our consumption is impacting the climate and the planet. We are, because it doesn't just affect us, it affects our kids and our children's children and our children's children's children and so on. And that's why brands that offer customers the choice of renting buying secondhand, buying recycled products or pre-loved products, in addition to having access to new products, will acquire more customers and gain market share. And I can tell you right now, as of June, July, 2023, that re the resale of products is growing at five times the average retail growth, uh, retail sales growth. 
Look at brands such as Decathlon, who are proactively promoting to customers who can trade in their old sportswear or equipment or donate it to other customers who can't afford to buy these products. Even a global fast fashion brand such as Zara now has a similar model because they recognize they have to address consumer concerns over fast fashion. And this is where customers can also trade in their old items or donate them to consumers who can't afford to buy new products from Zara in the first place. You can measure the return on image in a number of ways. You can measure the increase in sales across repurposed, recycled and upcycled products. You can measure the increase in the percentage of sales that come from pre-loved products or the percentage of uh, customers that are renting versus buying products. You can measure the increase of word of mouth, referrals and advocacy, customers who are prepared to promote your brand on your behalf. And of course, you can increase you can measure the increase in sales and profitability. Just a few quick wins for you. Put a plan in place to move away from not only selling new products, but to offering recycled, pre-loved and rentals. Also enable customers to trade in their old items against new ones and have a clear policy and approach to sustainability and all forms of social responsibility. The latter includes ensuring that your supply chain, in other words, the companies that you that make your products, that they are also doing all the right things when it comes to everything to do with the planet and everything to do with being socially responsible and how they treat their own staff. My fifth ROI is return on intervention. Retailers must move away from thinking of how they serve customers from a customer service perspective to customer care. Why? Because the former tends to be less about resolving issues for customers uh, and it's much more about managing the cost to serve them in the first place. And that leads to customer dissatisfaction and detraction. It also leads to customers churning. Whereas the latter, the customer care approach, is all about adopting a lifetime value approach to dealing with customers and looking at building relationships with them beyond the initial transaction. You can measure the return on intervention in the following ways. The percentage of customers' issues that are resolved first time will increase. You'll have less calls or contacts made with your customer service team. You'll see an increase in net promoter scores, even more so if you measure the before and after of that experience. You'll see an increase in customer lifetime value, CLV. You'll also see, obviously, an overarching increase in sales and profitability. And there are a number of quick wins that you can get after here. First of all, you can empower your colleagues to make decisions for customers. So I talked about that earlier. The more you inspire and empower your colleagues to make decisions, the more the better job you will do of resolving customer issues. You can incentivize your customer care team in the contact center, not by their volume of productivity, i.e. not by how many calls they answer in a day, by, but by the first time resolution of customer issues. You can continually capture the voice of the customer through surveys, through ratings and reviews. And that way you can always be on top of where the points of friction are in your business. You can walk the customer's journey yourself and on a regular basis. And that way you can see firsthand what needs to be improved. My next ROI is about return on interaction. When retailers and other consumer facing businesses offer more touch points and opportunities for customers to buy from them. And when they do this, they become stickier. They spend more and they buy more frequently. To give you an idea, omni channel brands with multiple channels tend to see a 15 to 35% increase in average order values or a 5 to 10% increase in profitability and a 30% higher increase in customer lifetime value compared to brands that only operate through a single channel. In other words, a business that only operates in a physical environment or in a digital environment. And the source for that is IDC. This flies in the face of the common approach, as I say, which is to reduce the cost of serve. When a business is focused on the reduced to serve, often it leads to a reduction in the channels and touch points that that business operates in. Marketplace solutions also provide a similar opportunity for brands because they can extend the range where they get the opportunity to sell from third party sellers or other brands without having to buy their products in the first place. It's a dropship model. By doing that, uh, businesses increase average order values, they increase the number of units per transaction that customers buy, and they increase customer lifetime value. It's also a great driver for customer ret retention as well as making you accessible to a broader range of customers. Now, to give you an example, 
Who would have thought that M&S, Marks and Spencer, or Next, who had only ever previously sold their own brand, would actually go on to sell other people's brands on their websites and their stores and through other channels? This has had a massive impact on enabling them both to extend their reach to new customers as well as drive up customer lifetime value and the frequency and also the retention of their existing customers because they're more relevant. They've got a broader offer. You can measure the impact of this in a number of ways. You can measure the increase in sales and profitability. You can measure the increase in the value of multi-channel customers. You can measure an increase in conversion, average order values, and the frequency of purchase. And there are a number of quick wins. Ask different cohorts of customers where else they shop. You can look to implement a marketplace solution, enabling you to offer the customer base more choice and to increase frequency of purchase. And that can be done actually quite quickly. So those are genuine quick win opportunities. My next ROI, number seven, is return on improvement or return on improvements. Across all of retail, only 28% of customers make a repeat purchase. That is shockingly low. And, and yet 88% of customers say that the service a business offers is as important as its products or services. That is why this ROI is about adopting a service-led approach to customers, because I believe in turn, that will encourage customers to come back. It's no longer good enough just to sell stuff. We also need to make it easier for customers to, to improve their usage of the products we're selling them. So for example, where we help to install a new appliance or a TV or build a shed or put up a fence or decorate the, the lounge with the wallpaper they acquired from us in the first place. As we all become increasingly uh, task rich and time poor, moving it from a do it yourself, I'm more of a damage it yourself person, to a do it for me model becomes even more prevalent. Home Depot are a great example of a business that's very service-led. They are the leader in the home improvement category in, in, in DIY in the US. They're the kind of equivalent of B&Q in the United Kingdom. They're a very service-led business. They have a very strong focus on providing uh, services that enrich the customer experience and buying from them. So in this ROI, you can measure the impact of this in a number of ways. The, the level of repeat purchases, the increase in the frequency customers purchase, the increase in their average order values, the increase in sales and profitability, and the increase in overall customer lifetime value. And there are lots of quick wins to get after. You can canvas opinion from customers and colleagues as to what services you might add to different parts of the business. Ask customers, give them a voice, let them tell you what they would be looking for. You can offer, uh, to give you an example, from offering tradesmen in, in DIY to build your fence to offering a chef service when they come to your home to cook and prepare a meal for your dinner party. There will be multiple opportunities to layer services on top of products to offer more values to customers. From offering tradesmen and DIY to build your fence or build your shed to offering a chef service when they come to your home to cook and prepare a meal for your dinner party, there's going to be multiple opportunities to layer services on top of products to offer more value to customers. My eighth ROI is about return on involvement. Hilton Doubletree uh, deliver a very different check-in experience. Normally, when you go into a hotel, the first thing they do is ask you to handle your passport, your driving license, or some form of proof of who you are, as well as your payment, before they even let you over the threshold. Um, whereas Hilton Doubletree give you a brown paper bag. I'm suspicious when people give me a brown paper bag, even more so when it's warm. But you open it up and you get a waft of these beautiful homemade cookies. And what they're doing is they're welcoming you into the hotel. And they're saying that although you're staying in a hotel, they want it to feel like a home from home. The Scandinavian premium underwear brand, CDLP, offer a discount offer of a second purchase. So no sooner have you made your first purchase, you get a discount code with your order where you can buy again. And actually the products are great. And I went and bought some more. Then you're asked to complete, complete a survey and if you do that, they give you a slightly bigger discount. And guess what? You go and buy more underwear from CDLP. Customer-centric brands understand it's down to them to provide opportunities for customers to get involved with their brand. They're not going to do it without you encouraging them. And in doing so, that starts to change how they feel about engaging with you. You can measure the impact of that in a number of ways. You can measure the increase in frequency of purchase. You can measure the increase in net promoter scores and customer satisfaction, or CSAT for short. 
you can measure the increase in customer lifetime value, and you can measure the increase, of course, in sales and profitabilities. Now, a couple of big quick wins here. One, we've been talking about personalization for 25 years, yet you can count on one hand the amount of truly personalized communications that you receive from a brand. And there's a really quick fix there. If you've got the right data structure, you can easily create a, nurtured, a nurturing email program with some behavioral driven communications based on what we like, what we bought before, that will encourage customers to come back and buy more frequently. And as the example I gave with CDLP, the Scandinavian underwear brand, do had a simple printed card with the customer's name handwritten with a discount of a second purchase into their order. And I guarantee you that will encourage a fairly significant of customers to go and buy again. Then follow that up with an email encouraging the customer to complete a short survey with an additional incentive, incentive to do so. And all of a sudden, you're starting to build that engagement, that involvement, and that lifetime value. My number nine ROI is return on insight. And I know as somebody who's run trading across number, a number of channels as head of online and multi-channel for brands like Harrods, Petlin Brands, Burberry, Ted Baker, I know from my own experience that what we tend to do is we, we measure and focus and report on outputs. We've got more data than you can shake a stick at, but what we don't necessarily have is insight. So sales, conversion rates, average order values, how many units per transaction somebody bought, traffic, unique visitors, returning visitors, are all interesting to know and, of course, relevant to report upon. But none of them tell us why we're performing how we are. They only tell us how we're performing, but not why. It's the understanding the why that helps us to make better decisions and pull the right levers in the future to improve our performance. So take conversion rates. Who cares that the conversion rate is 5%? Who cares whether it's up or down week on week, 50%? What is much more interesting is to understand why are 95% of our customers coming to our website every week and not buying something? How many of them actually had an intent to buy and what got in the way and stopped them from doing that? Why is it that only 28% of customers across the whole of the retail sector don't buy a second time? That's very interesting to get under the skin of. Why did 3,225 customers, or however many it was, call our contact centre? What can we learn from that? Because that insight enables us to make sure we don't make the same mistakes again for other customers in the future. And you can measure the impact of all of that in a number of ways, one of which is measuring customer satisfaction, CSAT, net promoter scores. Yes, we can, of course, look at conversion, sales, AOVs, UPTs, repeat visits, and all the other KPIs you can shake a stick at. Lots of quick wins here. Run regular surveys online asking customers if they if they found what they were looking for on the website and if they didn't, why not? You know, what stopped them from making a purchase or why were they even there in the first place or coming into the store for that matter? When was the last time I buy things online every day? And I'm telling you, I can count on one or two fingers in the last five years, maybe even longer, anytime somebody's actually bothered giving me, you know, um, giving me an opportunity to feedback when I've been on the website about the experience. You can implement pre and post purchase or pre and post issue resolution, net promoter scores or customer satisfaction. How did customers feel before? How did they feel after? And of course you can review why customers are contacting your contact center or your customer care team in the first place and you can make immediate improvements to make sure other customers don't have the same issues in the future. A final ROI is return on innovation. If you need to be 100% sure, I guarantee you, you're going to be 100% late. And the traditional return on investment model absolutely kills that stone dead, right? It's like a brick wall that you'd be facing. And that's because you're going to be 100% late because your CFO or your board or your boss are asking you to prove, you need to prove to me, give me a business case, that I'm going to spend X and I'm going to get Y back. Do you think any of the disruptive brands, the Ubers, the Airbnbs, the Amazons, could prove their business model at the outset when they started their business? Of course they couldn't. But every bone in their body told them they could use technology and create an experience that would improve the traditional experience in their industries, in their sectors, in order to drive up customer lifetime value. And I know it's not easy to convince a CFO or a board that testing and learning is the way to go. I appreciate that because I've been where you are. I've been on the client side and I've had those conversations many times. 
Um, and I know it's not easy when you can't prove the business case, but it's because it's never been done before. So how do you convince them to take a calculated risk? Do you know what? As with all things in life, sometimes you just need to trust your gut. If you researched the customers of the brands that I've highlighted above, I can guarantee you almost all of them would think of themselves as a fan of the brand. These are businesses that understand what it means to put customers and their own people at the heart of all they do and to do all those other things really well. They already have some form of emotional connection with those brands. It's not just a transactional relationship that they have with most other businesses that they buy from. Now, you can measure the impact of that in many ways, the increase in sales and profitability of new ideas or new products or new services, the improved levels of net promoter scores or customer satisfaction, because those are very strong indicators of whether those people will become advocates of yours or whether they are detractors. Quick wins empower people to make decisions, remove the fear of failure. I guarantee if you do that, you will become a more commercially successful business. So what's my conclusion to all of this? Well, we have to inspire our people and provide an environment where they can thrive. We have to have a good culture. As the great strategist Peter Drucker said, culture and strategy for breakfast. Your strategy isn't worth the paper it's written on if you don't have a good culture, if you don't trust your people, if you don't give them some autonomy and you don't empower them to do their jobs to the best of their ability and get things done. We must always act with integrity, building trust with our customers. The more we can do to create a business whose structure and people reflect as customers, the more we're going to be able to ensure that we meet their needs to the best effect. And how diverse and inclusive we are, or our levels of diversity and inclusion, I believe, are very much at the heart of us being able to achieve that. We've got to be socially responsible outside of our business and within our business. We need to be active in the community. We need to be more than a passive corporate bystander. That is when our image becomes a driver for our business, for engagement and for our performance. The more we can do to always seek to solve problems for customers first time round, the more frequently they're going to come back. It's a no-brainer. It really is not rocket science. Whilst, we also, whilst they also become vocal advocates of our brand, and that is their nirvana, we don't want to always have to invest in customer acquisition marketing. Wouldn't it be great if we had customers who did that on our behalf? And if we ensure we turn up where our customers want and expect us to be, then the more they're going to buy from us both now and in the future. And as we transition from simply transacting to becoming more of a service provider for our customers, we start to move the needle about how they feel about our brand, because that's when we start to build a more emotive connection with us. And allied to that, the more we engage our customers with relevant, and I mean relevant, personalized messaging and experiences, the more frequently our customers will come back to us, because we're demonstrating that we actually care about them and that we actually understand them and what they want and what they don't want to hear from us. And if we focus on moving from just reporting data to leveraging actionable insight to improve performance, all of our KPIs will move in the right direction. And last, but by no means least, we should always look to move forward and at pace as we continually seek to improve what we do. Hope you enjoyed that. My name is Martin Newman. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Thank mm -hmm. you.